Well, good morning again, everybody. It is great to see you. If I don't have a chance to know you, uh, my name is Will Davis Jr. Thanks for coming. Okay, so you guys appreciate what these guys do every week. I know you do. All right, let's put a slide up. If you want to be one of them, we'd like you to join us. Okay, so I know there's some talent out there. I've heard you sing. I've seen you dance, okay? And we're looking for more musicians and technicians in our church. And so if you, have, if you have some chops or you think you have some chops or you'd like to get some chops, um, or if you don't know what chops are and want to find out, then you can contact, there's a contact here somewhere, worship at acfellowship.org. Let's make a deal. Yeah, I'm not going to give you the number, but if we get a certain number of new musicians out of this, I will audition for drums. <laughs> deal? Okay, but we got to get a certain number. So... Uh, by the way, you guys know that um, I'm, I didn't get to teach last week, so I'm very hyper this morning. You know, I had this arm done a few weeks ago, and I've been doing hand motions like this for the last, you ready? Look at that. How, how impressive is that? Oh, wait, it's stuck. I can't get it down. I'm stuck. Anyway, progress. Okay. So, if we'll, I'll play the drum. I'll audition for drums. It'll be a short audition, but I'll audition for drums if we get a certain number of musicians. Okay, um, if you need a Bible, will you raise your hand? We'd love to give you a copy of God's Word. Please take it. Uh, we're glad you're here. And so if you don't have one of these, uh, raise your hand, we'll give you one. And we're gonna find Matthew chapter 14. And we're gonna find Hebrews chapter 11. And I'll read you a couple of others. There'll be several on the, scripture, on the screen today. Uh, you might wanna get your phones out uh, to take pictures of the screen. Uh, as well, I'll be sharing things you might want to hang on to later on. Matthew 14 and Hebrews 11, let me pray. Lord, we love you. Thanks for the time together. Thank you so much for the rain. Uh, We need it. Thanks that came over the lakes and helped fill the lake country out there west of here. And I pray for safety. I pray for safety for our team headed to Wind River Ranch in Estes Park, Colorado to serve in now what is about two feet of snow. That they'll have a great trip serving that great group of people this week and their missions efforts, Lord. Um, I pray you'd humble me. I pray today will be a breakthrough day, Lord. Um, we've just been praying as we conclude this series on maturity today that it'll be a breakthrough day for some folks. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we talked about three weeks ago about determining your next steps spiritually. It was a week after Easter in this series called Maturity. We talked the next week about watching your daily diet and making sure you're healthy spiritually with good spiritual intake of God's word and checking out, being careful for spiritual food poisoning and spiritual malnutrition, putting things in your spirit that are not good for your spirit. Last week, Kenton Boone talked to us about the power of community and joining a team and had you do business card handoff at the end, which was so cool. We, we have a new definition of love here at Austin Christian Fellowship. Somebody hugged somebody else so hard last week, they drew blood. Honest truth. Earring pierced skin and drew blood. That's the new level of love. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to stand up and go hug somebody until they bleed, okay? I'm kidding. Anyway, but the whole point was you can't do this alone. You can't do it alone. So today I get to talk to you about one more area, and this is going to be the one that's going to just, um, it's just fun. One more area where Christians can learn to grow in their maturity, and you're going to love it. It's called taking a step of faith. Now, one of our vocalists said to me, you're going to do the Indiana Jones, you know, leap of in the dark? No, but that's what come to mind. That's what people think of when you think of taking a step of faith. Um, I'm going to give you in just a minute some areas where Christians tend to hesitate in obedience and maybe mute or hinder their faith development as part of the process. But first, let's take a look at a really fun picture of faith in Scripture. It's in Matthew, that first passage I give you, Matthew 14. Um, It's the, the wonderful image of Peter walking on the water, or at least attempting to walk on water. And the scene is Jesus has fed the 5,000. First time he feeds a multitude. Um, and he sends uh, his disciples ahead in a boat and says, I'll meet you later. He stays to pray, dismisses the crowd. And then while the disciples who are trained, you know, they know how to be in a boat. They're fishermen. They've seen storms. Massive storm comes. They think they're going to die. And here comes Jesus. In control and over, ruling over nature, 
literally walking on the tops of the waves. I don't believe this was a hallucination. I don't believe it was, as one writer said, really, really shallow water. I think it was Jesus, because he has control of nature, showing that this can be done. And Peter basically says, can I play? You're like, oh, this looks like fun. So uh, verse 28 of Matthew 14, Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Now, you know Jesus is like, this is going to be so much fun. Because Peter has no idea what he's getting into. Uh, but he just, I love Peter's faith. It's like, hey, if you can do that, I'd love to try. Notice that Peter's the only one on the boat that felt like this was just a good idea. The rest of the guys are going, we're staying in the boat. Peter's like, I want to play. Let's go. So uh, Peter got out of the boat, verse 29, and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, how many of you have ever seen wind? He saw, he saw the effects of the wind on those waves. He, saw the, he felt the water hitting him in the face. He saw the trenches between the waves and the rollers. And he took his eyes off Jesus, and he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Okay? Now, there's an actual Greek text floating around that no one has seen of top ten other things Peter may have said at that moment when he started to sink. And I've read it, and I can't, it all requires a seven-second delay, but just know that he was a fisherman, and I can't share it with you. Other than, ah! That's all I can share. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said, You have little faith. Why do you doubt? He didn't say no faith. He said little faith. But he did rebuke him for not having faith sufficient to ride out the storm. Mark the word faith. Hebrews 11.6, next verse says, for without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's God. It's a real problem for many of us because we want to cerebral our way to the, God, to the God of the universe. We want to think our way to God. And at some point, your logic and your reason are going to come to the end of themselves because God is bigger than our logic and our reason. He doesn't fit in a plan. He doesn't fit in a formula. And so in order to really understand and please and have a relationship with God, you have to graduate past what is known in the world as reason and logic into that realm of what makes sense but can't be proven based on reason and logic. And that's where faith kicks in. Without faith, you can't please God. You can't know God. You can't discover God. You can't obey God. The whole thing is a faith transaction. Because those who come to God, the scripture says, must believe that he is, that he exists. That's the first step. And secondly, look at this, that he rewards those who seek him. So when you're seeking that which you cannot see, when you're taking steps in your life to go after a God that isn't provable but is lots of evidence for, then you've entered into the realm of a relationship that pleases him. Because if you, if you want to be able to prove God and not have to have any faith and know this is going to work out every single time, you, you're not in the realm of Christianity because God is beyond our ability to prove him. He's infinite. He's beyond our ability to know him if he doesn't make himself known. And so the entire arena, even you being here today, is a faith gesture that there's a God who you cannot see that you believe in. And is in that arena where he is pleased and where he blesses you. So when I bring up faith, I think some people immediately go, well, I'm a loser in the faith department. Let me put a statement on the screen here. I think you probably have more faith than you realize. Most people I talk to that beat themselves up in the arena of faith and don't think they're faith giants don't understand how much faith they really have. If you're a Christian, you've got unbelievable faith because you prayed a prayer for God to save you and he did. If you're a Christian, you've already asked God to do the biggest thing he can do for you, which is send his son, he sent his son, would you redeem me from my sin and rescue me and make me whole? And he did. So you've got way more, most people have so much more faith, maybe not the faith that moves mountains yet, but most of you have more faith than you ever thought. And I want to affirm that faith. And now what I want to do is say, here are four things, four areas, very quickly, I'm going to move pretty fast through them, 
where Christians can gain momentum in faith just by doing what God has said. Now, I want to kind of go ahead and say these aren't really even faith actions because they're promised in Scripture, and God says, if you do them, I will honor you. In fact, they're not just promised in Scripture, they're commanded in Scripture. And so it doesn't really require faith to do what God commands because he also says, when you do what I command, I will bless you. And we have all these biblical evidences of God blessing when we do what he commands. And 2,000 years of experience in our own lives as well. So this isn't really a step of faith, but for some of you, it's going to feel like one. For some of you, it's going to feel like, whoo, that's huge. And I want to tell you, if these areas I'm about to mention, if you will go ahead and just do this, then you're going to experience that rush of what it's like to walk on the water with Jesus and to know him at a level that other people don't know. Now, when I share them with you, you're going to think I'm going to lay out these big, hairy, you know, move to Afghanistan for 10 years and be a missionary. These are really four pretty simple things. The first one is baptism. <laughs> baptism. It's a huge step. It's the first step of obedience. And so many people delay it. So many people stall. So many people put it off. So many people make excuses. They have faith. They love Jesus. But there's something about the public getting in the water. All the excuses come up. I'm embarrassed. I'm an introvert. I don't want to be seen in a, you know, in a hot tub in front of people. Uh, my parents, all the reasons people have for not wanting to be baptized. And yet it's been the universal symbol of acceptance into God's family for 2,000 years. And we don't get a pass on it. People get baptized in other countries at the risk of going to jail, and we make excuses like, I don't want to be in a t-shirt in front of people. They might think I'm overweight. So let me show you a verse. Acts 2.41 says, those who, Kenton shared this verse last week, and we're going to do a couple of those again. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And there was added that day to the church about 3,000 souls. The received his word is the key phrase there. Because some of you will argue that, well, my parents had me baptized. And that's enough. Or I don't want to dishonor them. And I always like to push back. You've done many, many things as an adult that go against your parents' will, and you've been just fine. Okay? You've made decisions that they don't agree with. You've lived a lifestyle they didn't think was right. You vote for people they didn't want you to vote for. You listen to music you shouldn't listen to. The biggest decision you're ever going to make is to follow Jesus, and you're going to delay that because you don't want to dishonor your parents. I don't buy it. It's your, when you, when you receive his word, when you catch the ball of his word, when you're old enough, to, mature enough to understand what that means, and it can be a child, it can be a seven, eight, or nine-year-old on a childlike level, but it's your decision, not a decision your parents make for you. Some people don't get baptized because they think they're not ready. How do you get ready for a baptism? Stop sinning. If you stop sinning, you don't need to be baptized. You can hang out with Jesus. People say, oh, I'm not serious enough about this. All it requires is belief. All it requires is belief. But the ripple effect of what happens when you get baptized is so huge. And we're going to baptize next Sunday. And I want to tee this up as, for some of you, a step of faith that you need to take. And some of you guys online. I want to tee this up as some of you are feeling right now your little heart go pitter-pat. <laughs> and God is saying, you need to get baptized like right now because it is the first step of obedience. Quit putting it off. Quit saying you're going to first overcome this sin or get your ducks in a row because you can't get your ducks in a row without me. Just get in the water and proclaim my name and watch me work. And every time we do this, people, I've never seen, I've never known anybody, I've been doing ministry 40-something years, that's regretted being baptized, not one. Now, I'm doing this, I, wanted, I felt led to share this with you. I don't get paid by quota on baptisms. I wish I did, but I don't. So I, there's nothing in this for me. We're not trying to make some list of churches that baptize the most people. There's nothing in this for me if you get baptized. It is 100% for you. And those who do it will tell you, yeah, man, what a moment. It's an act of obedience that God honors. So we're going to put a, a, a slide up about how to sign up. Take a picture of this if you want to. We've already got six or seven people signed up for next weekend. We're going to baptize both services. And some of you online, 
that have been kind of experimenting with sticking your toe in the water with Christianity, you need to get out of the shadows. Some of you in the room here that every week you come, and, but you've never united with the church in baptism. It's time to go public and do what every serious Christian before you has done and quit putting it off. And I will, I will, God will honor it. I'll do more than play drums if you get baptized and you hate it, okay? You're going to think it's the most amazing thing you've done. That's area one, baptism. Can anybody guess what area two is? Yikes, you said the T word. It's giving. He said tithing, it's giving. Aren't you glad you came today? You should have stayed in bed. Again, I don't get paid by how much money you give. We pay our bills every month. We pay our staff every month. We give away a lot of money every month. We don't need to beg you to give. If I'm teaching about giving, it's for you. It's not for me. So just hear me out, okay? Don't get mad. Don't hide your wallet. I'm not going to take an offering. We already did. I could do it right now. We're not going to do it. There's an immediate call in Scripture to give God your best. It goes all the way back to the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, we call it tithing, but it's really a command to just hold everything he gives you loosely. Your gifts, your skills, your talents, your money, your time, it's not yours. It is true that the church is notoriously underfunded. And that most Christians, based on, based on what Christians make versus what Christians give. So there's a real stronghold and fear or something in the Christian community about money. Because we don't think we can afford to let it go of it. We lead with a what if, or I've got to pay my bills. And, and it's, again, it's a faith transaction. It's a, it requires faith to get baptized and believe God's going to honor it. It requires faith to give. But what God does when you make that statement of faith is he, again, responds in ways way beyond what you would expect. And again, I've never known anybody who started giving that's regretted it. I just know people who wish they started, would have started giving sooner. That's all I know. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, I love this passage. It's a command um, to the people of Israel to bring the whole tithe, a tithe is a tenth, into the storehouse so that there might be food in my house. I mentioned this earlier during the grace gift time. The way God provides for food in his house, and that day it was sacrifices, and that day it was food for the priests. They couldn't own land. They couldn't have a salary. They were given only what people gave. Kept the temple going. Food in the house today looks like, if, in case of ACF, whatever bills we have to pay, paying our staff, but mostly the food in the house that we have is an effort to really fund other ministries. Yeah, we have overhead, and we, we're debt-free, I don't know if all of you know that. We don't have any debt. Um, so we have operational expenses to do ministry for you every week. But really, we try to get money out the door to ministries around the city and around the world. That's food in the house for us. God says, I want you to put food in the storehouse. I want you to put food in the storehouse. And then watch. In fact, he says, test me. It's the only place I know of in Scripture where God says, test me. And see if I won't flow so much with blessing for you, you can't contain it. Now, my wife and I have lived that for, in our marriage, 38 years. We've been tithers, or more now, we tithe more than 10%. On my salary, and whatever she gets from her website or book sales or whatever, we've always given more than 10% of that, 10% and now more, and we have always had way more than we should. If we get a stock gift from somebody, we tithe on that. If I go preach somewhere and get paid for preaching here, we tithe on that. And I mean, I, it's, I've lived it. So I'm a, I'm a convinced participant. And so what I can also tell you is some of you have financial issues because you don't tithe. Because the next verse says, if you withhold, I'll curse the land. See, obedience matters. So some of you are living in a cursed land because you, you don't give to God what's his and you hang on to it and it, 
in the language of manna, gets maggots the next day. You're working seven days a week, you can't get ahead, but you don't give. And the reason you can't get ahead is because you don't give. I know it makes no sense, and you can't put this in a spreadsheet, don't try. But it works. And so I'm, gonna, I'm nudging you, some of you, to take a step of faith and decide today in the service you're going to start giving generously, minimum 10%. And you're like, I can't, I can't make my ends meet now. I understand. It's because you don't have the hand of God stretching what you can do. Now, again, I have nothing to gain in this. I won't know if you give or don't give. I don't know who gives here. If you write the check to somebody else's church, I won't know that. You can do that so you don't think it's an ACF thing. But if I want you to try giving. I want you to try giving and go hard at it and give it your best shot and discover that God is real. When you write the check and within 24 hours something has happened or you've gotten the money back and you're like, how did that happen? And I know people all of them experience that. They've written a check for the first time and within a day they've gotten it back in their bank account and they go, that, that shouldn't have happened. And they realize you, God loves giving. And the people that get hurt most, besides the people we don't get to serve when you don't give, is you because you're missing the blessing of what God does when you give. So I'm asking you to take a step of faith and start just, you're not the exception. Your finances don't get a pass. You'll submit your resources to God and he will bless them. I promise you. Any witnesses in the room on this, by the way? Anybody agree with this? Okay, they can't see you. Don't raise your hand. Clap real loud so I can hear you. Okay? 100% it works. 100% it works. Okay. Here's the, the QR code. There's a book, Treasure Principle, you ought to read. Now this is, a, we're talking about steps to maturity. You can't get to maturity if you don't give, friends. Period. You cannot get to maturity if you don't give. So let's time to face up to it and start giving. So there's the treasure principle. You should read it. It's amazing. And there's a QR code for more information about giving at ACF. Um, we always do a money back guarantee. I'm serious. If you start giving and you hate it, you think it's terrible and it's a bad idea, write us a note and say, I've been giving since April. I want my money back. We'll write you a check for it. No questions asked. Deal? <laughs> okay, number three. No rocket science here. Basic steps. These are things we have to do to grow. It's what Kenton talked about the entire time last week. I call it community. He called it joining a team. It is impossible to grow as a Christian to maturity in isolation. Period. You absolutely have to have other Christians in your life on a significant level. There is no way to become a serious Christian. When Peter, when Peter who said, Jesus, I will die, die for you, followed Jesus at a distance, he denied him almost immediately to a 13-year-old. If you're running outside the pack alone, in your Christianity, you're, you're a target to be taken out. You can, just like you cannot thrive in your Christianity if you don't get baptized and learn how to give, you cannot thrive in your Christianity. I'm, not trying to be, I'm just trying to be very direct today. You will not thrive without others encouraging you along the way. We call it community. Um, Kenton quoted this verse last week, and I love it. It's one of our favorite verses here at ACF, Acts 2.42. They were continually, it's they, plural, were continually as a team devoting themselves to four things, apostles teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. There was this communal thing going on. They prayed together, they ate together, they celebrated together, they grew together, they worshiped together. They were together. Acts chapter one says they were all together in one place. Acts chapter two says God fell on that togetherness and gave his Holy Spirit. Men, I think, are the biggest delayers of this one. I think women have a sixth sense about how important this is more than men do. I read an article recently about how men, men don't like the community thing because they don't want to be made to look stupid. If somebody asks a question and they can't answer it or if they don't know the Bible verse, if somebody says, turn to the book of Hezekiah and they'll start looking for Hezekiah, well, there is no Hezekiah in the Bible, so that would be a problem, okay? And they start, they don't know how, they're like, I don't want to look stupid, I don't want my stuff to come out. I've got an image to protect. I have a, an image in the neighborhood, in the community, and if I start 
I'm leading a Bible study for a bunch of guys in their office setting, which is a riot. I go in to every two weeks to this office and do a teaching on scripture for a bunch of guys in their office setting. And it's weird for them because they're not used to having, even though most of them are Christians, they don't have those kind of conversations at work. That's, this is a church conversation. We're having it at work. And like now I'm asking them to talk about prayer and talk about vulnerability and talk about their self-esteem and talk about their identity. Like, no, 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 we don't talk about that kind of stuff here. Men, men are afraid of being known and afraid of being dis- disappointing people, afraid of being found out. But the point is, so you're isolated and now you're going to die. So in small groups, we don't ask you, we don't make you sign a, like a, a truth thing. Just go and listen, go and share, go and learn, go and meet some friends. But guys, and again, I want to talk to some of the men online who are watching me right now instead of being here. Because it's awkward for you or you don't like the music. You'll never grow beyond you as long as you sit on that couch and don't come here. You'll never grow beyond the best you can do in your faith. And you know what? The kingdom of God deserves better than the best you can do. So get off the couch and get into church. Our ratings just dropped about 400%, but that's okay. You can't do it alone. So the action point I want you to take is to, here's a link, QR code, which sort of one it is. Just do some exploring. We have an amazing team in our department that Kenton leads. The team he leads is amazing. They're so good at helping people connect. And you can try it. And if you hate it, if it's weird, you can try another group. It doesn't have to be an ACF group for that matter. We, it, again, this is bigger than ACF. If you can find a group of guys or girls or mixed, couples, whatever, youth, whatever, that you can relate to, that you can grow in, jump in. We want you to grow. And we offer it here so you can grow. But if you find something else better somewhere with a group of people you relate to, go hard there. But the point is, don't dare try to do this alone. Jesus had a team. You need one. It's a step, listen, it's a step of faith toward maturity that God will honor and that you can't hit maturity without. So again, I'm giving you four steps this morning that are not optional. They're like, if you want to grow, you have to do these things. Sorry, it's like if you want to get my, I'm a grandfather fourth time over this week, by the way. My, my fourth grandchild, yeah, so cool. My fourth grandchild Landed safely in Denver, Colorado this week. I've got four naturally born Colorado grandchildren, not a Texan in the bunch. There's something so wrong with that. That little baby is being fed and being taken care of around the clock. And that's what we do with babies. We do the same thing with Christians. There's there's things you have to do to grow. And you can't just take a new Christian and put them over here and say, good luck. Because they will die in their faith. Don't be that soil that the devil steals the faith from in Matthew 4 or Mark chapter 4. Read it. Okay, I got to move on. Last one. Any guesses? Okay, I, I can't hear you, so I'm going to go on. Praying, yes, that's, but that's not it. Talking to others about Jesus. Talking, witnessing, as we call it. There's a command given at the end of Jesus' life, go and make disciples. It is make disciples. But that requires you start with people who aren't disciples. And so one of the things we have to learn to do, this is because many of us are absolutely mute Christians. We're like the guy in the scriptures who Jesus had to heal, they couldn't talk. There's so many Christians who can't talk. Like, I'm not talking about this. It's private, it's personal. I will pray for you. I may write you a letter one of these days, but don't ask me to talk about my faith. That's embarrassing. Or scary. People don't, don't witness, because, witnessing is a term for sharing what you've seen. About the scripture calls, Jesus called people his witnesses. I call it talking to others about Jesus to kind of take the pressure off a little bit. Just talk to people about Jesus. It's just casual. But people don't because they're afraid they're not going to have answers, which you're not. Get, you know how many times I say, I don't know in a day? Like 10,000. And I've never had somebody refute God right then because I didn't know the answer to their question. Some of you listen to our podcast. How many of you times have heard me say, I don't know on the podcast? Like every single time. I don't know. 
Let's find the answer out together. The kingdom of God is not gonna fold if you have a bad witness experience, and most people that take a shot about talking about Jesus have a better experience than they think. Like, oh, I had no idea God would meet me there. But there's, again, it, you know why? Because it requires faith to witness to somebody. To say, have you ever thought about God? What's your, what's your God story? What do you think of, what do you think? I saw somebody with a cross two days ago. I said, tell me about why you wear that cross. What's that mean to you? Just, you're wearing a cross, what's it mean to you? Just bring it into the conversation. Many of us are terrified about that. And if you want to reach maturity, you're going to have to learn to talk about Jesus. If you want to reach maturity, you're going to have to learn to get verbal about your faith. Because let me show you a really great verse. Acts chapter 8 verse 4 says, those, Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. So there's a great persecution that hits Jerusalem after Stephen is executed. And the Christians have to flee Jerusalem for their lives. And as they went... The reverse happened to what the Jews wanted. The more they went, the more they talked about Jesus. So now, the, it's, and now it is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. It's spreading. Because as they go, yeah, we're fleeing because we follow Jesus. Oh, really? Who's that? And the, the word of God just spread like wildfire. You have a neighbor. You have a classmate. You have a work station neighbor, a relative, a hairdresser, a person who delivers your mail, the Amazon delivery person you're getting to know pretty well because you have a lot of Amazon coming in, that you can talk to without being weird about Jesus. You know what? Take out the without being weird part. Have you heard some of the stuff people are talking about out there? It's okay to be weird. I mean, really? So here's how you start. Number one, pray for people who need Jesus. Have a prayer list of people that don't know Christ and start praying for them. It will develop your concern for them. And it can be people around the world that, like you know, are leaders or celebrities or athletes that you don't know, but you know they're not Christian. Start praying for them. But also pray for the people in your classroom or people at work or people in your neighborhood. Pray for them. Secondly, pray for the courage to share. Lord, give me courage to talk about you. Are you willing to do that? Give me the courage to talk about you. You died for me. Give me the courage to talk about you. <laughs> and then third, pray for opportunities to do so. And their car will literally break down in front of your house. Happened to me. Or you'll wind up talking in a classroom, in an AISD classroom. I prayed for an opportunity to talk to kids about Jesus one time. Within an hour, I was standing in front of a classroom of delinquent kids in AISD. It was not on my calendar. An hour, I was, I can't tell you how I got there, but it happened. Like, oh, here's my chance. So if you pray for opportunities, you're going to get opportunities. The neighbor is going to come across. You're going to pray for this. Your neighbor is going to say, so how you doing? He hadn't talked to you in a year. He's going to walk up today and go, how you doing? Like, you got something for me? And you're going to know it's because you prayed. This is striking terror in the hearts of some of you, I can tell. If you don't tell them, they won't know. All right, here we go. Got to finish this up. Here are four declarations. You ready? Please hold your applause. I'm almost done, okay? Four declarations I want you to start praying and saying. Let's get off, the, let's get off this immaturity rant and start acting like we know what we're doing in Christian faith, okay? It's time to grow up. It's time to press on to maturity. We're finishing the series today. Okay, we're moving on to other topics. It's time to get off the fence. It's time to get in the water. It's time to start giving. It's time to start talking to people about Christ. It's time to start sharing your faith in a community setting. Period. It's time to grow up. I'm on a rant. Do you hear it? Let's go. I mean, come on, folks. It's time to get in this game. Let's give so much money to the church that we solve world hunger. Can we try, please? Okay. Declaration number one, I will not live a halfway Christian life. I will not. I'm not going to stick a toe in the water for somebody who died for me. Declaration number two, I will not offer up halfway obedience. God did not say, here are five commandments and five suggestions. There are ten commandments. So I'm not going to be obedient where it's convenient and disobedient where it's mine. I'm going to be obedient 
because it's called abandon. I'm going to abandon to Jesus. Number three, I will step out in faith as God leads me. When he says, hey, go across the street and mow your neighbor's lawn or send an email to somebody and give them a Bible or go on a mission trip or write that first check or pray for somebody you hate and despise, do it because there's something in it for you and there's something in it for others. Don't negotiate with God. And number four, I will expect, Hebrews eleven six. 6, I will expect God to honor my faith. Friends, you can't get there without faith. So here are four areas where you can tar- start taking steps if you need to. Some of you have others. Some of you know God's saying, you're past these, but you need to start this. You need to pray this. You need to forgive this. Go. He'll never let you off the barrel of faith. You're going to be over the barrel of faith for the rest of your life. Just get used to it. Okay, so while you meditate on those four declarations, these guys, J.D. and I talked about this great song. Y'all know it. If you don't know it, you can say seated or just listen to the lyrics. But this is, this is a song about, I'm going to say some things that are going to change my life. I am not going to give God my leftovers. I'm going to give my God my best. Those kind of things. Hear them sing it and say it. You agree with them in prayer. You stand if you want to, however you want to respond. But let's, let's declare we're moving on. We're moving on. And we're doing so in Jesus' name. Lord God, bless the time. Thank you for it. Move on us in Jesus' name.